Well, this has been fun. You probably, many of you probably have seen a lot of this already before, but uh, hopefully it'll still be, you know, worth your while to be sitting here. Uh, my, my other hope is that uh, I've been praying for God to continue to, do, to give us revelation on this, because this is still fairly new information. It's really only been out since 2008 to a certain extent. Um, and so we are really in need of more enlightenment, more revelation. So we, I'm just praying to God he'll give us more. Uh, we do see through that mirror darkly, dimly. But it does appear that a lot of puzzle pieces are coming together, which is very interesting. So we are going to start here at the beginning, which is the best place to always start. Genesis 1, verse 14, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be for signs and for seasons. Those are the two important words right now that we're going to look at. And uh, here we've got to just take a little side note. It says God's not into astrology. Okay? Uh, astrology is strictly forbidden from uh, God's standpoint. It, uh, astrology tries to take God out of the picture. God says no to that. However, astronomy is okay. The study of the movements of the celestial bodies is not forbidden. Uh, in fact, this, is, this verse is saying God uses these as his instruments, and they are to be signs for us. Okay, so the heavens really are God's galactic billboard. And they are, uh, they are one means through which God communicates to us. Obviously the best is this, okay, because uh, I don't know about you, but I look up at the night sky and go, really? So, you know, it's the galactic billboard, and God uses it to communicate with us. Now, the signs, that word, that they are for signs, for seasons, days, and years, that word in the Hebrew is ot. It's a signal. It is literally or figuratively a signal like a flag or a beacon, a monument, or an omen. Okay? Seasons, that word comes from the word in Hebrew, moed or moed. Um, properly, it is an appointment. It is a fixed time or a season. It's also a signal as in beforehand. Uh, it's an appointed sign. It's an appointed time. Okay? So those are the two words that we need to take a look at is signs and seasons. That is what uh, God is saying there. Now, Jeremiah 8, 7, this is what the Lord says through his prophet. He said, even the stork in the sky knows her seasons, her moed. And the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the, the time of their migration, but my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. That's not very good to have the birds of the air more cognizant of what's going on as far as the seasons go than God's own people. But that's what he's saying here. 1 Thessalonians 5.1, Paul writes, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Those of us in the 20th, 21st century go, Yeah, please, help us. Because we don't know. But why didn't Paul have to write to them about the times and the seasons? Because they knew. They already knew. Us, not so much. Okay? Way back then they knew, but us, no. Matthew, chapter 25, verse 13, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, for about 1,700 years now, since the Christian church has been divorced from its Jewish roots, we really could only take those words literally. And so we all thought, we're not going to know the day or the hour when he's coming. 
What we did not know is Jesus, by saying that, was giving us actually a huge clue of when he would come. Huge clue. First off, Jesus would say, was saying that the day of his return would be at the time of a new moon. That's what he was saying. It would be at the time of a new moon. Okay? Um, why is this? He says, because the sighting of the new moon wasn't the easiest thing for God's people to do. There had to be two witnesses up on the Temple Mount looking in the sky for the first sliver of that new moon. And once they saw it, then they could say, okay, that's the new moon. But it, there could be like a 48-hour difference. And so that day where they were watching for it became known as the day and hour when no one knows. But we didn't know that in the Christian church because we got disconnected from our Jewish roots. But Jesus was giving a very, very big clue as to when he was coming. Now, uh, there are 12 or 13 new moons observed in the course of a Hebrew year, but there is one that is especially significant. Okay, and, and that new moon is the beginning of the Jewish civil new year, or Tishri 1, or Rosh Hashanah on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, but Tishri 1 isn't just the civil new year, it also marks the Feast of Trumpets. Okay? Uh, so, the question of course is, is it possible that Jesus is telling us that sometime in the future he will return on the Feast of Trumpets? You know, it's a question mark, but it, it's a good, good possibility because he's saying you don't know the day or the hour. Well, the Feast of Trumpets is the only festival or feast that happens on a new moon. The only one. So, uh, there are other fall observances that the Lord gave to Israel in addition to the Feast of Trumpets, and those are the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, here's what we already know. We already know that Jesus fulfilled the spring feasts that the Lord gave to Israel. He fulfilled those spring feasts to absolute perfection. <laughs> Absolute perfection. It's just amazing. Uh, so, let's consider that briefly. Okay, this isn't the clearest of the clearest slides, but I took it off of another thing. These are the spring feasts. Let me just, I could point, but these are never really good. Uh, the spring feast. God told Moses, he said to him, this day is going to be your new year, the first day of your new year. So, the first day of their, the Jewish religious New Year, is Nisan 1. That marks the first day of the religious New Year for the Jews. And so that was a beginning. What we know, and this was given to them in Egypt. So then, God says to them, as they're getting ready for that first Passover, uh, which, of course, became a pattern for all the other Passovers. He says, take a lamb, an unblemished lamb from the flock, on the tenth day of Nisan. And they are to be inspected for three days. Okay? Inspected for three days. And then uh, at, the, at Passover, they were to be slaughtered at twilight. Okay. So now what happens is, is that when you get to the time of Jesus coming and his beginning to fulfill all of those requirements uh, of the, the spring festival, uh, the lamb is inspected. What was happening in Jerusalem on that day that we have come to know as Palm Sunday when all the you know, people gathered around him and were praising God and, and singing the psalms, uh, particularly the Hallel, uh, Psalm 113 through 118, uh, he was coming in to Jerusalem through the east gate, but coming through the sheep gate were all the lambs that were going to be slaughtered for Passover. And the people were praising God with the same psalms. 
So you've got Jesus coming in from the east and the, sh the, the lambs, the blemish blemishless lambs coming in through the sheep gate. Everybody is singing the same thing. And what was upsetting to the priests and so forth was the fact that the people were singing the praises to Jesus. That upset them. But what was happening then right after that, in these three days, those lambs are being inspected for any kind of a blemish. They had to be blameless. Well, what we know in the scriptures is during that time, if we read the Gospels, that's when Jesus was being tested by the scribes and the Pharisees. Until finally they said, we're not going to ask him any more questions. Ah, he had passed the test. Perfectly. Okay, he was now the spotless Lamb of God who could be sacrificed. I mean, John had said it already in John chapter 1 or John chapter 2, you know, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So on Passover, what is happening then, since he is ready to be sacrificed, what's happening congruent to what's happening with Jesus, you've got to look at what's happening at the temple. You've got the lambs about to be slaughtered. Now, on Passover, there are three sacrifices. Normally, each day there are two the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. The morning sacrifice happened at 9. The evening sacrifice happened at 3. However, since it was Passover, they moved the evening sacrifice up to noon, and the Passover lamb was then slaughtered at 3. So, when Jesus is being nailed to the cross, it's 9. It's at the time of the morning sacrifice. Okay? At noon... At the time of the evening sacrifice, which has now been moved up because it's Passover, that's when darkness covers the whole earth. And it is not a natural darkness because Passover always happens at the full moon. So it's not natural. Then when Jesus cried, Nagmar, it is finished, it's 3 o'clock. That's the time when the Passover lamb was being slaughtered. So to the exact hour, Jesus is fulfilling all of the requirements of this meal and the daily sacrifice. It's all being done in order. Well, we know from Scripture that his disciples wanted him off the cross before Shabbat. Because it was a special Shabbat. It was a Passover Shabbat. So they wanted him off. Um, before sundown, what happens then is he is then in the grave by the evening of Passover, and he is in the grave one day and night, two days and nights, and three days and nights. He is the unleavened bread. He had no spot, sin, wrinkle, blemish in him. So these are all the they are, all the Jews are observing this unleavened bread. They have gotten the leaven out of their house. No sin in the house. Because leavening is often, not always, but often um, associated with sin. So they get that out of the house for this week. So he's in the tomb one day and night. Two, day, two days and night. Three days and night. And then on the morning of the first day of the week... When the Jews are presenting the first fruits, it's the feast of first fruits, Jesus is rising from the dead because he is the first fruit from the dead. And then they continue with that week of uh, you know, celebrating unleavened bread and then keeping on, the, now they're, they're counting the Omer. Now they're going up to 50 and on the 50th day is Shavuot and the um, pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That constitutes the spring lineup. Okay? Now, now, you know, we can assume now, I think, that probably sometime in the future Jesus will fulfill all of the fall feasts to perfection. It just makes sense. If he did it in the spring, he'll do it in the fall. The first time he came, he took care of the spring. Now he's going to take care of the fall feasts. So, um, so let's look at the fall feast. We're going to line them up next to the spring feast. Look at that. 
mirror image. Absolutely mirror image. In the spring, we have the first day of the month, a month here of Nisan. That's the religious new year. Tishri is the first day of the civil new year. It is the feast of trumpets. When the lambs were inspected on the 10th day in the fall, it's a day of atonement on the 10th day. And then when we have the unleavened bread week, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, God has wanted to tabernacle with us since he created us. Sin is what got in the way. But eventually, we will be tabernacling with him and he with us forever and ever. Amen. But those, that's the lineup for the fall feast that Jesus will someday, one day, um, fulfill to perfection. But it's just rather amazing when you look at it like that. It's like, wow. Wow. Um, let's move on. Now, that is, so it's a pretty safe conjecture that when Jesus returns, he's going to fulfill all the fall feasts to perfection. Now, having said all this, we're going to take some little sidebars here, and uh, we're going to look at some other signs. Joel 2, 30 to 32a. The Lord through his prophet said, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. That's one passage. Now we have Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Jesus said, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, millions of people had wondered what these passages have meant. You know, most, most thought they'd just fall off the sky or something. I know I did, so it's like, I figured I probably wasn't alone. Until recently, there was not even a consideration that these words of our Lord could be referring to eclipses of the sun and the moon. Like I said, 2008 is when Mark Biltz got God's download. You know, there, there may have been other people who knew, but uh, it just didn't get out into the world or into the church that this is what uh, God was quite likely re referring to. So, Mark Biltz uh, the Lord showed him in 2008 that there was going to be a tetrad of total lunar eclipses in 2014 and 2015. Now, a tetrad of total lunar eclipses is four full eclipses in a row. Four in a row. Tetrad meaning four. So they would, sh they would happen in 2014 and 2015. Now, these would be April 15th in just a couple of days. Today's the 6th, nine days from now. Uh, then October 9th, April 4th, and September 28th. So two uh, this year and two next year. Now, they don't look remarkable from the standpoint of the calendar that we use. However, from the, from the Hebrew calendar, we get this. April 15th is Nisan 15th, or Passover. October 8th is Tishri 15, or Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles. April 4th of next year is Nisan 15, Passover again. And then September 28th of next year uh, is Tishri 15, or Tabernacles. Okay, you're looking at that and it's like, this is no coincidence. Not by any long shot. Uh, so this is what, you know, we've got these lunar eclipses. Uh, again, Passover, Tabernacles this year, Passover, Tabernacles next year. Uh, the reason why we haven't necessarily made any kind of connection is because we don't use the Hebrew calendar. And because we don't use the Hebrew calendar, which is God's calendar, we miss the connection. Because, you know, you go back here, well, you can't make any connection with April 15th, October 8th, April 4th, and September 28th. It doesn't work. And it, it's only when you get onto the Hebrew calendar that you notice it's the same thing. 
Um, so obviously this is amazing and it is significant. Um, now, question is, have tetrads of lunar eclipses happened in the past? And so if they have, what was going on? Well, here you go. These are the tetrads of lunar eclipses on the Jewish feast in the last 500 years. Uh, beginning in uh, 1493 and 1494, uh, four, no, 1949 and 50, and 1967 and 68. Okay, so the significant here is, is this. You look at these. These are all on Jewish feasts again like they will be this year. Passover, Tabernacles, Passover, Tabernacles. What's going on in 1492, we know that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, but in 1493-94, around that day, uh, Spain is kicking the Jews out of Spain. They're being kicked out. Columbus, Columbus was a Jew. Yeah. Um, then, in 1949-50, and 50, Israel has just become a brand new state. God has in one day established her. But already she has had to fight her neighbors. You know, they didn't, you know, the, the neighbors around her weren't interested in her becoming a state at all, and so she immediately had to fight for her life. Then in 1967 and 1968 was the Six-Day War. Okay? So we have the Jews being kicked out of Spain, uh, Israel becoming a nation but having to fight immediately for her existence, and then the Six-Day War. So that's what's happening in these tetrad years. Uh, so given uh, what has been taking place historically, um, when we've had a tetrad of lunar eclipses on the Jewish feast days, um, the Jews are now going, uh-oh, what's going to happen now? Okay? What's going to happen now? That's what they're thinking. I mean, they know what's happened in the past, what's going to happen in the future. Now, here are some possibilities. I'm just going to throw out some possibilities. Some possibilities are prophetic wars. Isaiah 17 could be one. Uh, Psalm 83 could be another. Ezekiel 38 or Zechariah 14. Um, psalm 83 isn't, it doesn't look much like a psalm. It's, it's, um, it's really more of a God help me and... Uh, defend me against my adversaries, which could be at any time, okay, not necessarily a specific time. Um, Isaiah 17 is actually the destruction of Damascus to the point where Damascus is destroyed forever, okay? Ezekiel 38 and 39, that is the war of Gog and Magog. They probably end, 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 end time war. And Zechariah 14, uh, that is where we find out that there will come a day that Jerusalem will be ransacked. You know, right now there's, you know, we know that the Lord is protecting Jerusalem, but there will come a day when he will allow Jerusalem to be captured. It's the only way that his word can be fulfilled. I mean, it's a bad thing to think that way, but it's the truth. It's in the word. Okay, so that's what, those are possible prophetic wars that could happen. You know, since we look in the, in the you know, hindsight, we see what has happened in the past. Um, but there could also be some possible economic upheaval. Possible economic upheaval. Now, do we have historical evidence to corroborate this possibility? Okay, that's what we're going to look at now. Well, yes, we do. We have historical evidence. Um, now, beginning on the evening of September 24th, 2014, we enter a new Jewish year. We move from 5774 to 5775. And 5775 is a Shemitah year. Okay? It is a Shemitah year. Um, and, of course, many of us would just say, what in the world is a Shemitah? Well, we're going to find out what a Shemitah is. The answer is found in Exodus 23, Leviticus 25, and Deuteronomy 15. Now listen, here is the Shemitah explained. God said to Moses, 
For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Leviticus 25. Speak to the Israelites, says the Lord to Moses, and say to them, When you enter the land I'm going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather your crops. But on the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. If a fellow Hebrew, a man or a woman, sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free but not empty-handed. Okay. So, from these passages, we know that the Shemitah was a letting go, a rest, a release, a remission, a dissolution, or a cancellation of debt. That's what the Shemitah is. Um, the Shemitah year was year-long. That land was to lie fallow for a year. Uh, it affected absolutely everybody. But it culminated on the last day of the civil year, which is Elul 29. Elul 29, the very last day uh, of the Hebrew year, was when the creditors had to cancel the debts owed them. That's what it was all about. Now, in a sense, it was effectively economic equalization. And it was wonderful for debtors and the poor, but not so wonderful for the creditors. Especially those who didn't want to lose the profit they would have gained if the Shemitah year were a normal business year. This naturally begs the question, did Israel faithfully observe the Shemitah? No. Uh, so what was the consequence of their unfaithfulness to keep the Shemitah? Exiled to Babylon for 70 years. Uh, why 70 years? Well, we get the answer. One year for every Shemitah, Judah did not observe. So, God hand, this is from uh, 2 Chronicles 36. God handed them over, handed Judah over to Nebuchadnezzar, who carried them into exile in Babylon. And in verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 36, we read, The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word the Lord spoke by Jeremiah. So this works out to for 490 years, Judah did not observe the Shemitah. And so you go back from the date of the temple being destroyed, and that takes you all the way back to the time of the judges, approximately 20 years before Saul was anointed the first king. That's a long time. Now, what we need to understand is this. The lack of observing the Shemitah wasn't the first thing to go in Israel. The first thing to go was their faithfulness to God. Little by little, Israel turned their back on God and they went after other gods. So the more you keep turning your back on God, the more you're just not going to be paying attention to the things he has said to do. Now, Failure to keep the Shemitah was a huge sign that profit was more important than God. So what was to have been a blessing to God's people, if observed by them, became a curse or a judgment because it was not observed. Now, what does any of this Shemitah stuff have to do with America? After all, we're not Israel and we aren't Jewish. And this is true. The requirement was given to Israel and to no one else. However, 
there's always a however. It's kind of like a big but. Uh, the mandate for Israel and the judgment they receive for not observing it becomes a prophetic sign to the nations of the world when they turn their backs on God and go after other gods. What in the world is a prophetic sign? A prophetic sign is evidence that God is operating in a similar way now as he has in the past by repeating a pattern in order to get the point across. He's saying, look what I'm doing. Take a hint. I'm trying to tell you something. Okay, according to ancient tradition, now we're going to get off again. Okay, We've, we will bring all of these home. But you got to, you know, got to lay it all the foundation and so forth. Now, according to ancient tradition, lunar eclipses were said to be the harbinger, a harbinger or omen for Israel. But solar eclipses were said to be a harbinger or an omen for the nations. Okay? Now, let's look at some solar eclipses. Are you all having fun? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I am, so I'm hoping you all are. Anybody sleep out there? No, oh, I don't see any snoozing heads. So now look at, let's look at solar eclipses. Let's look forward, okay, before we go backward. All right. Solar eclipses in 2015. Here you go. We have a total solar eclipse on March 20th, 2015. And we have a partial solar eclipse of almost 0.8% on September 13th, 2015. Okay? Again, looking at the Gregorian calendar, it does not make any sense. But, okay, now let's see. On March 20th, 2015, that's Nisan 1, the beginning of the Jewish religious year. All right? Okay, so that's, that's an aha. That's a flag going, hello, hello. Okay, then we get this partial solar eclipse, and that's September 13th, 2015, and guess what is it? It is the day before the Jewish Civil New Year, which makes it Elul 29. And it just so happens it is the completion of a Shemitah year. Beginning you know, this fall, when we move from 5774 to 5775, we're entering a Shemitah year. And it will culminate on Elul 29 of next year. Okay, that's pretty significant, since we've been hearing about Shemitahs already. Now, let's put them all together. In 2014, Passover and Tabernacles, full, complete eclipses. Then in 2015, we've got a total solar eclipse on March 20th, lunar eclipse total on April 4th, partial solar on September 13th, and then tabernacles September 28th. And so on, you know, 2015, we've got the Jewish religious new year, Passover, Elul 29, the end of the Shemitah year. Uh, that's when all the debts are supposed to be canceled, and tabernacles. I'm thinking, this looks pretty significant. It looks pretty amazing. Um, now, we don't know what may happen in the future on the next Elul 29 that's coming up next year. Um, we don't know what's going to be happening in the nations, particularly America. Uh, but let's look at previous Shemitah years. Because we've already lived through those. So let's look at them and see what's happened. Okay, the previous Shemitah was, okay, you take 7 from 2015, that takes us to 2008. The date of Elul 29 on the Gregorian calendar would have been September 28, 2008. What happened on that date? Well, at the end of the closing bell on September 28, 2008 on Wall Street, the Dow Jones fell 777 points or 7% of its value. Notice the sevens. God's number. His fingerprints were all over that day, and it is Elul 29, the cancellation of debt. When you've got that many points or any kind of a point fall, that is cancellation of debt. That is 
money being lost. The creditors, which are all of us who have, may have money in the stock market, we're losing it. So, at the end of the closing bell, on September 28, 2008, Wall Street, the Dow Jones fell 777 points, or 7%. Now, what if we go back to the previous Elul 29? What date will we be at then? Well, we'll be at September 17, 2001. Okay, that day, not only did the opening bell fail to ring, which they took it as a bad omen that day, by the end of the day, the Dow Jones had lost 7% of its value. Amazing, isn't it? Looking backward in time. Okay, so now what do we get if we take the 777 points lost on a little 29 in 2008 and go backwards? Seven, um, we go back the uh, seven days, seven hours, and seven minutes from the closing bell here on September 17th, 2001. If we go back seven days, seven hours, and seven minutes, the answer is September 11th, 2001, and it's just seven minutes after the first plane has hit the World Trade Center, that first tower. The first shaking, the first harbinger, the first visible sign of God's judgment had come upon America. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Just seven minutes. Nope, you can't make this stuff up. Um, but we can go back another seven years. <laughs> this is really interesting. Seven years to seven days in July. July 16th through 22nd in 1994, which, by the way, is another Shemitah year. Everybody's looking to see what's happening with the comet Schumacher-Levy. Okay, everybody's watching Jupiter. It was a Shemitah year, and 21 fragments from the comet Shoemaker-Levy struck the surface of Jupiter. And since it was a Shemitah year and equally divisible by seven, Mark Biltz writes in his book, Four Blood Moons. This is what he says. This is what he was thinking. It just so happened that that weekend was also the weekend of the 9th of Av, and it was a Shemitah year. Not only that, the Torah portion for that weekend was Deuteronomy 1 through 6, which in Hebrew is called Devarim, which means these are the words. It is almost as if the Lord was saying, listen to me, I'm speaking to you about coming judgment. 7 times 3 is 21. So I, Mark, felt that God was saying the next three Shemitahs would be times of judgment. That's what he was thinking to himself. The next three Shemitahs, we've, we've gone through two. There's one more to come, of course, next year. So, uh, as we have already seen 2001-2008 on Elul 29, financial judgments have come indeed to America and to the world. Well, why? Well, because America, like Israel, we have collectively turned our backs on God. Not everybody, but our nation has. And what God is trying to say is, return to me. He is trying to communicate with us. He's saying, return to me. Return to me. Um, now, let's go back to what God promised Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and following. God said, now listen to this. He says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now we know that a third Shemitah is coming next year, Elul 29. We don't know if there will be another financial collapse or if there will be war between nations or if there are not going to be any judgments at all. God's not in a box. He can do whatever he wants to. But so far, the prophetic sign has been given to us twice. So what are we going to do about it? Okay? God has already told us one thing to do. Okay? 
we the people of God, we're the ones who are called by his name, God shows us and told us, I just read it, that we are the ones that God is waiting for, for us to repent. He said, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Uh, it is up to the people of God to do the repenting because sinners aren't going to even think about it. It's up to us to do the repenting. And even if we don't think we're guilty, we're part of America. So it's like guilt by association. Not only that, what we have learned, particularly in Daniel, and this is happening more and more in the church today, is we are learning about identificational repentance. Identificational repentance is where you identify with what's going on and you repent, even if you didn't have a thing to do with it. You repent for the sins of the nation or for the sins of a, of a people or a culture or a group. You repent because God says, if my people, and we're the people of God. Um, so I think that's number one on the list, is for us to be repenting for the sins of our nation uh, and for crying out to God. Um, you know, we know what happened with Nineveh when they repented. God did not destroy them. He did not destroy them. It made Jonah look pretty bad. Because he said in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. It didn't happen because of God's mercy. So we're the people who are called by God's name because we Christians have been grafted into Israel. Another thing, and you know, you can roll your eyes, or not, is, uh, you know, if we carry any kind of debt or whatever, uh, credit card debt, loans, mortgages, we might want to pay them off if possible. Get out of debt. You know, don't have it hanging on the head um, when a little 29 comes. Or, put it this way, don't get into other debt. That might even be a better idea is don't incur other debt. Uh, get out of what you can, but don't incur other. It, it was, just won't be a good idea. And then lastly, you know, we might want to set aside emergency supplies. So the first place we start is with God. Lord, how do you want us to prepare? How do you want me to prepare? How he wants me to prepare may not be the same for you or anybody else in this room. Well, that would be it for the day. Got any questions?